This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Souls of Black Folk by W. E. B. Du Bois. Music and Text Recorded by Toria's Uncle. Chapter 13 Of the Coming of John. What bring they neath the midnight? Beside the river sea, they bring the human heart wherein no nightly calm can be, that droppeth never with the wind, nor drieth with the dew. O calm it, God, thy calm is broad to cover spirits too. The river floweth on. Mrs. Browning Carlisle Street runs westward from the center of Johnstown, across a great black bridge, down a hill and up again, by little shops and meat markets, past single-storied homes, until suddenly it stops against a wide green lawn. It is a broad, restful place, with two large buildings outlined against the west. When at evening the winds come swelling from the east, and the great pall of the city's smoke hangs wearily above the valley. Then the red west glows like a dreamland down Carlisle Street, and at the tolling of the supper bell throws the passing forms of students in dark silhouette against the sky. Tall and black they move slowly by, and seem in the sinister light to flit before the city like dim warning ghosts. Perhaps they are, for this is Wells Institute, and these black students have few dealings with the white city below. And if you'll notice, night after night there is one dark form that ever hurries, last and late, toward the twinkling lights of Swain Hall, for Jones is never on time. A long, straggling fellow he is, brown and hard-haired, who seems to be growing straight out of his clothes, and walks with a half-apologetic roll. He used perpetually to set the quiet dining-room into waves of merriment as he stole to his place after the bell had tapped for prayers. He seemed so perfectly awkward, and yet one glance at his face made one forgive him much, that broad, good-natured smile in which lay no bit of art or artifice but seemed just bubbling good nature, and genuine satisfaction with the world. He came to us from Altamaha, away down there beneath the gnarled oaks of southeastern Georgia, where the sea croons to the sands, and the sands listen till they sink half-drowned beneath the waters, rising only here and there in long, low islands. The white folk of Altamaha voted John a good boy, fine plow-hand, good in the rice-fields, handy everywhere, and always good-natured and respectful but they shook their heads when his mother wanted to send him off to school. "'It'll spoil him, ruin him,' they said, and they talked as though they knew. But full half the black folk followed him proudly to the station, and carried his queer little trunk and many bundles, and there they shook and shook hands, and the girls kissed him shyly, and the boys clapped him on the back. So the train came, and he pinched his little sister lovingly and put his great arms about his mother's neck and then was away with a puff and a roar into the great yellow world that flamed and flared about the doubtful pilgrim. Up the coast they hurried, past the squares and palmettos of Savannah, through the cotton fields and through the weary night to Millville, and came with the morning to the noise and bustle of Johnstown. And they that stood behind that morning in Altamaha, and watched the train as it noisily bore a playmate and brother and son away to the world, had thereafter one ever-recurring word. When John comes. Then what parties were to be, and what speakings in the churches, and what new furniture in the front room, perhaps even a new front room, and there would be a new schoolhouse, with John as teacher, and then perhaps a big wedding, all this and more. When John comes. But the white people shook their heads. At first he was coming at Christmas time, but the vacation proved too short. And then the next summer, but 
Times were hard and schooling costly, and so instead he worked in Johnstown. And so it drifted to the next summer, and the next, till playmates scattered and mother grew gray, and sister went up to the judge's kitchen to work. And still the legend lingered, when John comes. Up at the judges they rather liked this refrain, for they too had a John, a fair-haired, smooth-faced boy who had played many a long summer's day to its close with his darker namesake. "'Yes, sir. John is at Princeton, sir,' said the broad-shouldered, gray-haired judge every morning as he marched down to the post office. "'Showing the Yankees what a southern gentleman can do,' he added, and strode home again with his letters and his papers. Up at the great pillared house they lingered long over the Princeton letter. The judge and his frail wife, his sister and growing daughters. "'It'll make a man of him,' said the judge. "'College is the place.' and then he asked the shy little waitress, "'Well, Jenny, how's your John?' and added reflectively, "'Too bad, too bad your mother sent him off. It'll spoil him.' And the waitress wondered. Thus in the faraway southern village the world lay waiting, half-consciously, the coming of two young men, and dreamed in an inarticulate way of things that would be done and new thoughts that all would think. And yet it was singular that few thought of two Johns, for the black folk thought of one John, and he was black, and the white folk thought of another John, and he was white, and neither world thought the other world's thought, save with a vague unrest. Up in Johnstown at the Institute we were long puzzled at the case of John Jones. For a long time the clay seemed unfit for any sort of molding. He was loud and boisterous, always laughing and singing, and never able to work consecutively at anything. He did not know how to study. He had no idea of thoroughness, and with his tardiness, carelessness, and appalling good humor we were sore perplexed. One night we sat in faculty meeting, worried and serious, for Jones was in trouble again. This last escapade was too much, and so we solemnly voted that Jones, on account of repeated disorder and inattention to work, be suspended for the rest of the term. It seemed to us that the first time life ever struck Jones as a really serious thing was when the dean told him he must leave school. He stared at the gray-haired man blankly, with great eyes. Why, why, he faltered. But I haven't graduated. Then the dean slowly and clearly explained, reminding him of the tardiness and the carelessness, of the poor lessons and neglected work, of the noise and disorder, until the fellow hung his head in confusion. Then he said quickly, But you won't tell Mammy and Sister? You won't write Mammy now, will you? For if you won't, I'll go out into the city and work, and come back next term and show you something." So the dean promised faithfully, and John shouldered his little trunk, giving neither word nor look to the giggling boys, and walked down Carlisle Street to the great city, with sober eyes and a set and serious face. Perhaps we imagined it, but some way it seemed to us that the serious look that crept over his boyish face that afternoon never left it again. When he came back to us he went to work with all his rugged strength. It was a hard struggle, for things did not come easily to him. Few crowding memories of early life and teaching came to help him on his new way. But all the world toward which he strove was of his own building, and he builded slow and hard. As the light dawned lingeringly on his new creations, he sat wrapped and silent before the vision, or wandered alone over the green campus peering through and beyond the world of men into a world of thought and the thoughts at times puzzled him sorely. He could not see just why the circle was not square, and carried it out fifty-six decimal places one midnight, would have gone further indeed had not the matron rapped for lights out. He caught terrible colds lying on his back in the meadows of nights, trying to think out the solar system. He had grave doubts as to the ethics of the fall of Rome, and strongly suspected the Germans of being thieves and rascals, despite his textbooks. He pondered long over every new Greek word, and wondered why this meant that, and why it couldn't mean something else, and how it must have felt to think all things in Greek. So he thought and puzzled along for himself, pausing perplexed where others skipped merrily, and walking steadily through the difficulties where the rest stopped and surrendered. Thus he grew in body and soul, and with him his clothes seemed to grow and arrange themselves. Coat sleeves got longer, cuffs appeared, and collars got less soiled. Now and then his boots shone, and a new dignity crept into his walk, 
and we who saw daily a new thoughtfulness growing in his eyes began to expect something of this plodding boy. Thus he passed out of the preparatory school into college, and we who watched him felt four more years of change, which almost transformed the tall, grave man who bowed to us commencement morning. He had left his queer thought world and come back to a world of motion and of men. He looked now for the first time sharply about him and wondered he had seen so little before. He grew slowly to feel almost for the first time the veil that lay between him and the white world. He first noticed now the oppression that had not seemed oppression before, differences that erstwhile seemed natural, restraints and slights that in his boyhood days had gone unnoticed or been greeted with a laugh. He felt angry now when men did not call him Mr. He clenched his hands at the Jim Crow cars and chafed at the color line that hemmed in him and his. A tinge of sarcasm crept into his speech and a vague bitterness into his life, and he sat long hours wandering and planning a way around these crooked things. Daily he found himself shrinking from the choked and narrow life of his native town, and yet he always planned to go back to Altamaha. He always planned to work there. Still more and more as the day approached he hesitated with a nameless dread, and even the day after graduation he seized with eagerness the offer of the dean to send him north with the quartet during the summer vacation to sing for the institute. A breath of air before the plunge, he said to himself in half-apology. It was a bright September afternoon, and the streets of New York were brilliant with moving men. They reminded John of the sea as he sat in the square and watched them, so changelessly changing, so bright and dark, so grave and gay. He scanned their rich and faultless clothes, the way they carried their hands, the shape of their hats. He peered into the hurrying carriages. Then, leaning back with a sigh, he said, This is the world. The notion suddenly seized him to see where the world was going since many of the richer and brighter seemed hurrying all one way. So when a tall, light-haired young man and a little talkative lady came by, he rose half-hesitatingly and followed them. Up the street they went, past stores and gay shops, across a broad square, until, with a hundred others, they entered the high portal of a great building. He was pushed toward the ticket office with the others and felt in his pocket for the new five-dollar bill he had hoarded. There seemed really no time for hesitation, so he drew it bravely out, passed it to the busy clerk, and received simply a ticket, but no change. When at last he realized that he had paid five dollars to enter he knew not what, he stood stock still amazed. "'Be careful,' said a low voice behind him. "'You must not lynch the colored gentleman simply because he's in your way.' And a girl looked up roguishly into the eyes of her fair-haired escort. A shade of annoyance passed over the escort's face. You will not understand us at the South, he said half impatiently, as if continuing with an argument. With all your professions, one never sees in the North so cordial and intimate relations between white and black as our everyday occurrences with us. Why, I remember my closest playfellow in boyhood was a little Negro named after me, and surely no two. Well, the man stopped short and flushed to the roots of his hair for there, directly beside his reserved orchestra chairs, sat the negro he had stumbled over in the hallway. He hesitated and grew pale with anger, called the usher, and gave him his card with a few peremptory words, and slowly sat down. The lady deftly changed the subject. All this John did not see, for he sat in a half-daze, minding the scene about him. The delicate beauty of the hall, the faint perfume, the moving myriad of men, the rich clothing and low hum of talking seemed all a part of a world so different from his, so strangely more beautiful than anything he had known, that he sat in dreamland, and started when, after a hush, rose high and clear the music of Lohengrin's swan. The infinite beauty of the wail lingered and swept through every muscle of his frame and put it all a tune. He closed his eyes and grasped the elbows of the chair, touching unwittingly the lady's arm, and the lady drew away. A deep longing swelled in all his heart to rise with that clear music out of the dirt and dust of that low life that held him prisoned and befouled. If he could only live up in the free air where the birds sang and the setting suns had no touch of blood. 
who had called him to be the slave and bud of all? And if he had called, what right had he to call when a world like this lay open before men? Then the movement changed. A fuller, mightier harmony swelled away. He looked thoughtfully across the hall and wondered why the beautiful gray-haired woman looked so listless and what the little man could be whispering about. He would not be listless and idle, he thought, for he felt with the music the movement of power within him. If he but had some master work, some life service, hard, ay, bitter hard, but without the cringing and sickening servility, without the cruel hurt that hardened his heart and soul. When at last a soft sorrow swept across the violins, there came to him the vision of a far-off home, the great eyes of his sister, and the dark-drawn face of his mother. And his heart sank below the waters, even as the sea-sand sinks by the shores of Altamaha, only to be lifted aloft again with that last ethereal wail of the swan that quivered and faded away into the sky. It left John sitting so silent and rapt that he did not for some time notice the usher tapping him lightly on the shoulder and saying politely, Will you step this way, please, sir? A little surprised, he arose quickly at the last tap, and, turning to leave his seat, looked full into the face of the fair-haired young man. For the first time the young man recognized his dark boyhood playmate, and John knew that it was the judge's son. The white John started, lifted his hand, and then froze into his chair. The black John smiled lightly, then grimly, and followed the usher down the aisle. The manager was sorry, very, very sorry, but he explained that some mistake had been made in selling the gentleman a seat already disposed of. He would refund the money, of course, and indeed felt the matter keenly, and so forth, and before he had finished John was gone, walking hurriedly across the square and down the broad streets, and as he passed the park he buttoned his coat and said, John Jones, you're a natural-born fool. Then he went to his lodgings and wrote a letter, and tore it up. He wrote another, and threw it in the fire. Then he seized a scrap of paper and wrote, Dear mother and sister, I am coming. John. Perhaps, said John, as he settled himself on the train, perhaps I am to blame myself in struggling against my manifest destiny, simply because it looks hard and unpleasant. Here is my duty to Altamaha, plain before me. Perhaps they'll let me settle the Negro problems there. Perhaps they won't. I will go into the king which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. And then he mused and dreamed, and planned a life work, and the train flew south. Down in Altamaha, after seven long years, all the world knew John was coming. The homes were scrubbed and scoured, above all one. The gardens and yards had an unwanted trimness, and Jenny bought a new gingham. With some finesse and negotiation, all the dark Methodist and Presbyterians were induced to join in a monster welcome at the Baptist church. And as the day drew near, warm discussions arose on every corner as to the exact extent and nature of John's accomplishments. It was noontide on a gray and cloudy day when he came. The black town flocked to the depot, with a little of the white at the edges. A happy throng with good mornings and howdies and laughing and joking and jostling. Mother sat yonder in the window watching, but Sister Jenny stood on the platform, nervously fingering her dress, tall and lithe, with soft brown skin and loving eyes, peering from out a tangled wilderness of hair. John rose gloomily as the train stopped, for he was thinking of the Jim Crow car. He stepped to the platform and paused. A little dingy station, a black crowd, gaudy and dirty, a half-mile of dilapidated shanties along a straggling ditch of mud. An overwhelming sense of the sordidness and narrowness of it all seized him. He looked in vain for his mother, kissed coldly the tall, strange girl who called him brother, spoke a short, dry word here and there, then, lingering neither for handshaking nor gossip, started silently up the street. Raising his hat merely to the last eager old auntie, to her open-mouthed astonishment, the people were distinctly bewildered. This silent, cold man was this John. Where was his smile and hearty hand grasp? Peered kind of down in the mouth," said the Methodist preacher thoughtfully. 
Seems monstrous stuck up, complained a Baptist sister. But the white postmaster from the edge of the crowd expressed the opinion of his folks plainly. That damn nigger, said he, as he shouldered the mail and arranged his tobacco, has gone north and got plumb full of fool notions, but they won't work in all Tamaha. And the crowd melted away. The meeting of welcome at the Baptist church was a failure. Rain spoiled the barbecue, and thunder turned the milk and the ice cream. When the speaking came at night, the house was crowded to overflowing. The three preachers had especially prepared themselves, but somehow John's manner seemed to throw a blanket over everything. He seemed so cold and preoccupied, and had so strange an air of restraint that the Methodist brother could not warm up to his theme, and elicited not a single amen. The Presbyterian prayer was but feebly responded to, and even the Baptist preacher, though he wakened faint enthusiasm, got so mixed up in his favorite sentence that he had to close by stopping fully fifteen minutes sooner than he meant. The people moved uneasily in their seats as John rose to reply. He spoke slowly and methodically. The age, he said, demanded new ideas. We were far different from those men of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, with broader ideas of human brotherhood and destiny. Then he spoke of the rise of charity and popular education, and particularly the spread of wealth and work. The question was then, he added reflectively, looking at the low discolored ceiling, what part the Negroes of this land would take in the striving of the new century. He sketched in vague outline the new industrial school that might rise among these pines. He spoke in detail of the charitable and philanthropic work that might be organized, of money that might be saved for banks and business. Finally, he urged unity, and deprecated especially religious and denominational bickering. Today, he said with a smile, the world cares little whether a man be Baptist or Methodist, or indeed a churchman at all, so long as he is good and true. What difference does it make whether a man be baptized in river or washbowl or not at all? Let's leave all that littleness and look higher. Then, thinking of nothing else, he slowly sat down. A painful hush seized that crowded mass. Little had they understood of what he said, for he spoke an unknown tongue, save the last word about baptism. That they knew. And they sat very still while the clock ticked. Then at last a low suppressed snarl came from the amen corner, and an old bent man arose, walked over the seats, and climbed straight up into the pulpit. He was wrinkled and black with scant gray and tufted hair. His voice and hands shook as with palsy, but on his face lay the intense rapt look of the religious fanatic. He seized the Bible with his rough huge hands. Twice he raised it, inarticulate, and then fairly burst into words with rude and awful eloquence. He quivered, swayed, and bent, then rose aloft in perfect majesty till the people moaned and wept, wailed and shouted and a wild shrieking arose from the corners where all the pent-up feeling of the hour gathered itself and rushed into the air. John never knew clearly what the old man said. He only felt himself held up to scorn and scathing denunciation for trampling on the true religion, and he realized with amazement that all unknowingly he had put rough, rude hands on something this little world held sacred. He arose silently and passed out into the night. Down toward the sea he went in the fitful starlight, half conscious of the girl who followed timidly after him. When at last he stood upon the bluff, he turned to his little sister and looked upon her sorrowfully, remembering with sudden pain how little thought he had given her. He put his arm about her and let her passion of tears spend itself on his shoulder. Long they stood together, peering over the gray, unresting water. John, she said, does it make everyone unhappy when they study and learn lots of things?" He paused and smiled. I am afraid it does, he said. And John, are you glad you studied? Yes, came the answer, slowly but positively. She watched the flickering lights upon the sea and said thoughtfully, I wish I was unhappy, and, and, putting both arms about his neck, 
I think I am a little John. It was several days later that John walked up to the judge's house to ask for the privilege of teaching the Negro school. The judge himself met him at the front door, stared a little hard at him, and said brusquely, Go round to the kitchen door, John, and wait. Sitting on the kitchen steps, John stared at the corn, thoroughly perplexed. What on earth had come over him? Every step he made offended someone. He had come to save his people, and before he left the depot he had hurt them. He sought to teach them at the church, and had outraged their deepest feelings. He had schooled himself to be respectful to the judge, and then blundered into his front door. And all the time he had meant right. And yet, and yet somehow he found it so hard and strange to fit his old surroundings again, to find his place in the world about him. He could not remember that he used to have any difficulty in the past, when life was glad and gay. The world seemed smooth and easy then. Perhaps. But his sister came to the kitchen door just then and said the judge awaited him. The judge sat in the dining room amid his morning's mail, and he did not ask John to sit down. He plunged squarely into the business. You've come for the school, I suppose? Well, John, I want to speak to you plainly. You know I'm a friend to your people. I've helped you and your family, and would have done more if you hadn't got the notion of going off. Now, I like the colored people, and sympathize with all their reasonable aspirations, but you and I both know, John, that in this country the Negro must remain subordinate, and can never expect to be the equal of white men. In their place your people can be honest and respectful, and God knows I'll do what I can to help them. But when they want to reverse nature and rule white men and marry white women and sit in my parlor, then by God we'll hold them under if we have to lynch every nigger in the land. Now, John, the question is, are you, with your education and northern notions, going to accept the situation and teach the darkies to be faithful servants and laborers as your fathers were? I knew your father, John. He belonged to my brother, and he was a good nigger. Well, well, are you going to be like him? Or are you going to try to put full ideas of rising and equality into these folks' heads and make them discontented and unhappy? I am going to accept the situation, Judge Henderson, answered John, with a brevity that did not escape the keen old man. He hesitated a moment, and then said shortly, Very well. We'll try you a while. Good morning. It was a full month after the opening of the Negro school that the other John came home, tall, gay, and headstrong. The mother wept, the sisters sang, the whole white town was glad. A proud man was the judge, and it was a goodly sight to see the two swinging down Main Street together. And yet all did not go smoothly between them, for the younger man could not and did not veil his contempt for the little town, and plainly had his heart set on New York. Now the one cherished ambition of the judge was to see his son mayor of Altamaha, representative to the legislature, and, who could say, governor of Georgia. So the argument often waxed hot between them. Good heavens, father, the younger man would say after dinner as he lighted a cigar and stood by the fireplace. You surely don't expect a young fellow like me to settle down permanently in this, this godforsaken town with nothing but mud and negroes. I did, the judge would answer laconically, and on this particular day it seemed from the gathering scowl that he was about to add something more emphatic, but neighbors had already begun to drop in to admire his son, and the conversation drifted. Here yeah, that John is livening things up at the darky school, volunteered the postmaster after a pause. What now? asked the judge sharply. Oh, nothing in particular, just his almighty air and uppish ways. I believe I did hear something about his giving talks on the French Revolution, equality, and such like. He's what I call a dangerous nigger. Have you heard him say anything out of the way? Why, no. But Sally, our girl, told my wife a lot of rot. Then, too, I don't need to hear. A nigger what won't say sir to a white man, or who is this John? interrupted the son. Why, it's little black John, Peggy's son, your old playfellow. The young man's face flushed angrily, and then he laughed. Oh, 
said he. "'It's the dark here that tried to force himself into a seat beside the lady I was escorting.' But Judge Henderson waited to hear no more. He had been nettled all day, and now at this he rose with a half-smothered oath, took his hat and cane, and walked straight to the schoolhouse. For John it had been a long, hard pull to get things started in the rickety old shanty that sheltered his school. The Negroes were rent into factions for and against him. The parents were careless, the children irregular and dirty, and books, pencils, and slates largely missing. Nevertheless he struggled hopefully on, and seemed to see at last some glimmering of dawn. The attendance was larger, and the children were a shade cleaner this week. Even the booby class in reading showed a little comforting progress. So John settled himself with renewed patience this afternoon. "'Now, Mandy,' he said cheerfully, "'that's better, but you mustn't chop your words up so. If the man goes—' "'Why, your little brother even wouldn't tell a story that way, now would he?' "'No, sir. He can't talk.' "'All right. Now let's try again. If the man—' "'John!' The whole school started in surprise, and the teacher half arose as the red, angry face of the judge appeared in the open doorway. "'John, this school is closed. You children can go home and get to work. The white people of old Tomaha are not spending their money on black folks to have their heads crammed with impudence and lies. Clear out!' I locked the door myself. Up at the great pillared house, the tall young son wandered aimlessly about after his father's abrupt departure. In the house there was little to interest him. The books were old and stale, the local newspaper flat, and the women had retired with headaches and sewing. He tried a nap, but it was too warm, so he sauntered out into the fields, complaining disconsolately. Good Lord! How long will this imprisonment last? He was not a bad fellow, just a little spoiled and self-indulgent, and as headstrong as his proud father. He seemed a young man pleasant to look upon as he sat on the great black stump at the edge of the pines, idly swinging his legs and smoking. Why, there isn't even a girl worth getting up a respectable flirtation with, he growled. Just then his eye caught a tall, willowy figure hurrying toward him on the narrow path. He looked with interest at first, and burst into a laugh, as he said, "'Well, I declare, if it isn't Jenny, the little brown kitchen-maid, why, I never noticed before what a trim little body she is.' "'Hello, Jenny. Why haven't you kissed me since I came home?' he said gaily. The young girl stared at him in surprise and confusion, faltered something inarticulate, and attempted to pass, but a willful mood had seized the young idler, and he caught her arm. Frightened, she slipped by, and half-mischievously he turned and ran after her through the tall pines. Yonder toward the sea, at the end of the path, came John slowly with his head down. He had turned wearily homeward from the schoolhouse, then, thinking to shield his mother from the blow, started to meet his sister as she came home from work and break the news of his dismissal to her. I'll go away, he said slowly. I'll go away and find work and send for them. I cannot live here longer. And then the fierce, buried anger surged up into his throat. He waved his arms and hurried wildly up the path. The great brown sea lay silent. The air scarce breathed. The dying day bathed the twisted oaks and mighty pines in black and gold and there came from the wind no warning, not a whisper, from the cloudless sky. There was only a black man hurrying on with an ache in his heart, seeing neither sun nor sea, but starting as from a dream at the frightened cry that woke the pines, to see his dark sister struggling in the arms of a tall and fair-haired man. He said not a word, but seizing a fallen limb struck him with all the pent-up hatred of his great black arm and the body lay white and still beneath the pines, all bathed in sunshine and in blood. John looked at it dreamily, then walked back to the house briskly, and said in a soft voice, Mammy, I'm going away. I'm going to be free. She gazed at him dimly and faltered, North, honey? You going north again? He looked out where the North Star glistened pale above the waters and said, 
Yes, mammy. I'm going north. Then, without another word, he went out into the narrow lane, up by the straight pines, to the same winding path, and seated himself on the great black stump, looking at the blood where the body had lain. Yonder in the gray past he had played with that dead boy, romping together under the solemn trees. The night deepened. He thought of the boys at Johnstown. He wondered how Brown had turned out, and Carrie, and Jones. Jones? Why, he was Jones. And he wondered what they would all say when they knew, when they knew, in that great long dining room with its hundreds of merry eyes. Then, as the sheen of the starlight stole over him, he thought of the gilded ceiling of that vast concert hall, heard stealing toward him the faint, sweet music of the swan. Hark, was it music? Or the hurry and shouting of men? Yes, surely. Clear and high, the faint, sweet melody rose and fluttered like a living thing, so that the very earth trembled as with the tramp of horses and the murmur of angry men. He leaned back and smiled toward the sea, whence rose the strange melody, away from the dark shadows where lay the noise of horses galloping, galloping on. With an effort he roused himself, bent forward, and looked steadily down the pathway, softly humming the song of the bride. Freudig gefurt, sie heit dahin. Amid the trees, in the dim morning twilight, he watched their shadows dancing and heard their horses thundering toward him, until at last they came sweeping like a storm, and he saw in front that haggard white-haired man whose eyes flashed red with fury. Oh, how he pitied him, pitied him, and wondered if he had the coiling, twisted rope. Then, as the storm burst round him, he rose slowly to his feet and turned his closed eyes toward the sea, and the world whistled in his ears. End of chapter 13